What a great event. If you've been here with us this morning, uh, just let me see a show of hands who've been able to be with us with the panels today. Uh, do you agree with me? This has turned out to be a great event. Fantastic. Fantastic panels. And there's a reason for that. Uh, first, I want to do a few uh, thank yous. I, I got to start off at the top, and I want to thank my legislative partner and co host and our friend and your senator, Senator Robert Nichols, for the great work he's done in inviting these panelists. We have just a great, I think, Senator, you join me in this, just the, the folks we've invited, our colleagues, it's an honor for them to come here with us and be on these panels. You know, I've noticed, though, that your, your colleagues are much more respectful of you than my colleagues happen to be of me, and I'm, I'm not sure I understand that. Um, but uh, I also want to thank uh, Stephen F. Austin State University, Dr. Patillo, Tabler, thank you for hosting this event again. <laughs> what a wonderful facility. Uh, beautiful campus, and again, for those of you not from this area, welcome to the beautiful Piney Woods of East Texas. Also, I want to thank a couple of special sponsors. Uh, we have some board members and the representatives of the Texas Healthcare Association with us here today. If you please stand and be recognized. There we are. Y'all have to stand up. There you go. And just as a teaser, our next panel will be on health care, uh, and they're taking a very active role in that. Uh, unfortunately, one of our panelists, uh, our moderator, uh, Scott Street, the CEO of uh, Memorial Hospital here in Nacogdoches, has the flu. And does about the two or three of our panelists that's going around the state of Texas. So I guess if you didn't get your flu shot, it might be too late. But we'll talk about the health care after lunch. But thank you, Texas Health Care Association, for being the presenting sponsor of the Lone Star Legislative Summit. Also want to recognize our friends at Chenier Energy. If you please stand, Trent. Chenier Energy is our platinum sponsor. And then I would just, if you're also, if you're a, one of our sponsors, we have such a great list. Uh, one of the bad things about it is so long, it precludes me from reading the list. But if you're a sponsor of this event today, would you please stand? Thank you. I think this has turned out to be uh, if, uh, the largest uh, Lone Star Summit we've put on. Uh, also, I think the most uh, uh, profitable and beneficial to the Chamber, which is our, our sponsoring organization. So uh, again, and I appreciate the Chamber for allowing me to, to have this role within the, within the program. Uh, I want to recognize a few people that are also in the room. Uh, we have several representatives of our federal government. Kathy Comer with Senator Cornyn's office. There. Thank you, Kathy. Daniel Alders with Senator Cruz's office. Nacogdoches own right there. And Melinda Cardi, I doubt it was Melinda, or were you able to, there you are Melinda, great, with Congressman Gomert's office, thank you all. Also with us today, we have representatives from Governor Abbott's office, Ashley Morgan and Jay Dyer. Stand up please, that's not going to do it. All right, and uh, Ashley, I'm going to ask you to stand just one more time. Now Jay, we love you too, but if you could just give us an accent, Jack, our lumberjack in the governor's office right there. All right, and then also before we move to the next portion, I want to recognize if we, our SFA Board of Regents. If we, have, if we have any of our regents here with us, I see several of you there. If you would please stand and be recognized. And thank you for the work you do for the university. And then finally, any other elected officials? I've seen several of our commissioners, uh, uh, mayor, city representatives, uh, commissioners from Cherokee County and Nacogdoches. If you're an elected official, please uh, be, stand up and be recognized. And I want to thank you for your service. All right. Well, let's do this. I believe they're prepared to, to bring the food forward. It's already, let's uh, get that going. Uh, and at this time, um, are we on schedule to do that? Why don't we, Bill? Oh, we got one other thing we do have to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is a special guest that's come a long way, actually traveled through time to be here. If you've been in the morning sessions, we've had some historical vignettes. And we have somebody I'm particularly proud of. Uh, this is Adolphus Stern. Now, one thing I learned in the legislature, I looked up the history of the ledge, and I looked back for House District 11. Who has represented House District 11? And there's one former member from Nacogdoches County that served in 80 sessions ago from Nacogdoches in the fourth legislature, House District 11, and it's none other than the Honorable Adolphus Stern.
Guten Tag, Bonjour, Buenos Dias, Mazel Tov, and Hello. Welcome to Nacogdoches, where we see people from all over the world who come to us on the Camino Real. We like to believe that they come for our hospitality. During the Fredonia Re Rebellion, we roasted a bear to the New Orleans Grays. During the Battle of Nacogdoches, we supported the Texans, and we raised two troops two companies of troops for the Texas Revolution. Sam Houston, my good friend, was baptized in our parlor when he realized he could not own land under the Spanish government unless he was Catholic. I tell you now, as I told him then, everything that happens in Texas starts in Nacogdoches. And I hope that while you are here, you enjoy our hospi hospitality. In fact, I'd like to invite you to come to my home, which is just south of here where my wife and I always keep a bottle of spirits cooling in the cellar. Thank you, Adolphus. He's not used to adjusting the microphone in 1836, I suppose. Um, all right, well, again, let me, one last uh, group of introductions. I, I mentioned with Senator Nichols, the great group of colleagues we have here and other special guests. I'm going to try to do this looking around. Uh, Senator may want to introduce his Senate guest when he uh, does the introductions. Uh, but I'm looking around there. We've had several House members have come and gone uh, that have spoke, had to other commitments. Others are coming in this afternoon. Uh, but we really have a, a, an impressive group uh, on the panels and also some of our, our moderators. Uh, I'm looking over this table. I want to recognize Tracy McDaniel, the director of the Texas Economic Development Corporation. And she has done a fantastic job today with that panel. I've got Ron Simmons, Trent Ashby. If you guys would stand up as I call your names. Don't, don't worry, I'm not going to let them have the microphone. They're worse than me, actually. But Ron Simmons, Trent Ashby, John Frulo, Kyle Casal, Larry Gonzalez, all members of the House. At the other table, I've got Chris Patty. Look at Marsha Farney right there. Thank you, Marsha. Please stand up and be recognized. Jim Murphy. Houston, all right. Did I miss anybody? He's might slipped up. Where am I? Oh, where's Donna? Donna Howard, I'm sorry you're right there. How could I miss you? Thank you, Donna. Tan Parker's in the back there. Oh, guys, I can't see that far. That's, that's good. That's the good doctor. Yeah, Dr. Zerwas is in the back. And Tan, anybody else I missed? But this is really a testament to this community, this, this town, to have you guys come here and, and be part of the program. There's another half a dozen uh, uh, members that have been in and out, and, uh, but it, it, again, we can't thank you enough for you guys taking the time out of your schedules to come be with us. So, Senator, I'll let you introduce them when you come up here, and I'm going to bring uh, our president, interim president, he, makes, he puts the emphasis on interim, uh, to uh, lead us in an invocation. Thank you. Bill T. You know, before we have the invocation, I think it is appropriate that we once again say thank you to Travis and Senator Nichols. We really appreciate you and what you do. Would you help me say thanks, please? And would you pray with me, please? Our gracious God, we pause in this busy world to say thanks. We thank you for those willing to serve your people at the national, state, and local level. We pray you'll give them the courage, the wisdom, and the commitment to keep your commandments in everything they do. We thank you for the staff and volunteers who make this event possible and all the people that it takes to serve your people in your way. We thank you for the food, the hands that have prepared and served it, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to stay on schedule as best we can, and at this time it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce a man who needs no introduction, the Honorable Senator Robert Nichols. I appreciate that very much. I wanted to introduce, uh, I introduced at breakfast some of the senators that were here, and we, some have come and gone, but I want to introduce some, some more. Uh, Lois Cocors? from Brenham, Texas, home of Blue Bell ice cream, served in the House, was chair of Health and Human Services in the House. Now she's on finance and some other big committees. A great statesman uh, and somebody who really fights. If you're in a war, you want her on your side. 
I think Larry Taylor left a while ago. He had to be in uh, Houston. Charles Perry, are you still here? Charles Perry, he had to go to Lubbock. He came all the way down from Lubbock. He was chair of the Ag, Water, and Rural Affairs. Uh, Brandon Creighton, I think you're still here. Brandon Creighton, I thought I saw you back there. I think he may have bugged it. Anyway, we had Brandon Creighton came down from Conroe, vice chair of business and commerce, and Kirk Watson from Austin, uh, former mayor of Austin, uh, as serves on finance. He's on his way up here. He'll be on the panel this afternoon. I will tell you from my perspective, watching the different panels, many of us, we do bump into each other at different places. We go to committees together. We uh, uh, are in a legislature together, but not often do we get to just sit and listen to each other's ideas and plans for the future. And I will tell you, I've been watching the panels this morning. I was so excited, and I hope you are too, about the quality of the legislative citizens that we have uh, serving in the Capitol, listening to their ideas for the future. I know the state of Texas is going to be real good. So I, I, I very much appreciate the House members and the Senate members who've taken the time to leave their districts and be here today with us. And I want to tell you, it's a real honor for me and a privilege to introduce a former colleague of mine, that uh, uh, the state Texas comptroller. Uh, we came in the Senate at the same time, served on a freshman together, took the hazing, and uh, he's gone on to bigger and better things. So let me tell you a little bit about him. Glenn Hager was elected in the 30 th as the 33rd Texas comptroller of public accounts in 2014. He is Texas's chief financial officer and as such, he's the state's treasurer, check writer, tax collector, procurement officer, and revenue estimator. Hager is focused on his agency's constitutional duties, and he's committed to improving its customer service and transparency. He believes a less burdensome tax system will foster a better environment for job creation and business operation, which we agree with. As chief financial officer for the world's 12th largest economy, Hager monitors Texas Financial House to ensure it maintains strong fund balances, employs sound fiscal management, invests resources wisely, and approaches budget, budgeting with a consistently conservative point of view. In the legislature, we need good numbers for him to put our budgets together, and that's what we rely on. Prior to coming to the Texas Comptroller, he served in the Texas House of Representatives before he came over to the Texas Senate. And in the Texas Senate, when a House member comes over to the Senate, as Travis Clardy will tell you, we say that they're housebroken. <laughs> and so there he worked on a wide range of common sense solutions to problems on transportation, education, tax reform, Second Amendment rights, and many other things. He's a 1993 graduate of Texas A&M, a graduate of St. Mary's University, where he earned a Master's of Arts in his law degree. University of Arkansas, he earned his Master's of laws. He's a sixth generation Texan. I think this is important for East Texas. He grew up farming land that has been in his family since the 18, mid 1800s. His upbringing taught him core values of hard work, honesty, and integrity. He understands rural issues. He and his wife, Dara, have three children, Claire, Julia, and Jonah. Having served eight years with him in the Texas Senate, I will tell you he's an honest man. He works hard and he keeps his word. You should also know that he was here at the last legislative summit two years ago, and he came in the night before. He has come back since. I know he did a town hall here not too uh, many months ago. He came in last night. He knows where East Texas and Nacogdoches is. Please give a warm East Texas welcome to Glenn Hager, our comptroller. Thank you, Senator, and uh, it's good to be back with my good friend, Robert Nichols, as well as a lot of my co former colleagues and friends. Uh, you know, I'll tell you a couple things. One, you know this already, there is not a harder working member than Robert Nichols. I tell you what, <laughs> as Robert said, I, I, get, I grew up on a farm, so I get up pretty early, I get to the office pretty early in my first session, my staff, after several weeks, finally, my chief of staff, he said, okay, 
I've been trying to beat you to the office for two weeks. Can you just tell me what time do you get here so I can get there before you? But somebody like Nichols, he gets there before you and he stays later and after, but you know that he's a hard, hard worker. And if y'all could do me a favor, could y'all try to get Travis Clarity to come out of his shell? <laughs> the guy is just too quiet. He really, he never tells people how he feels or representing his district, an advocate for you. So uh, Travis, thanks for uh, being a friend and, and always somebody we can count on. You know, it's always a real privilege, uh, especially all the members. I've had a privilege to working with them over the years and, and people that you can really count on. And I think you've seen this in the panels, but I, well, I'll tell you, number one, I go around to a lot of different speeches and members are in the room and I always think, uh, back to what my mom said, says, Glenn Allen Hager, Jr., you know when they say your full name, you're in trouble. But uh, she'd say, if you don't have anything nice to say, keep your mouth shut. So if there's a member in the room, I say, hey, how are you, and just move on. But to this group, they're really a great group of legislators that work for their constituents here in their local areas and across the state. You know, in my role, as Senator Nichols mentioned, as controller of public accounts, I wear a very different hat. I'm not a policy maker. My job, first and foremost, is to tell the membership, the public, what is the economic health and conditions of the state of Texas? And sometimes I ask this question, is there anybody in this room with 100% certainty can estimate how much money comes in your personal household? And I don't want to know a number because it's not my business, it's your personal information. But can you estimate how much money will come into your personal household starting not tomorrow, but nine months from now, and then ending two years later? Anybody? Show of hands somewhere, one? Well, if you could, I want you on my revenue estimating team because I have to do that times 27 million people, 27, 12 different economic regions, 254 counties, the 12th largest economy in the entire world. Now imagine when I came into office 2014, the day I got elected in November, oil prices were roughly $74. I wonder why I remember this. The end of December, actually a week before Christmas, they were $60. The day I was to give a what's called the biennial revenue estimate, the estimate to the legislature that starts in nine months and ends two years for the state's 12th largest economy for their budget, and that morning one of the investment firms had said, no, we think oil now is going to be $39. So it's extremely important in the Texas economy. A lot of people have talked about and continue to talk about, is Texas going back to the 1980s? And the answer, first and foremost, is no. Oil is extremely important to this economy. It's really important, especially in certain sectors of those 12 economic regions. However, with that being said, we are a much more diverse economy than we used to be. Actually, if one point I'd like to make is that here in East Texas, if you take Southeast Texas region, 15 counties out of the 254 in the state of Texas, Nacogdoches County being one of that 15, this 15 county economic region, that in this region alone, in 2013 as an example, there was $29 billion of personal income in just those 15 counties. Think about that. If this area, and I'm not advocating for anything, but I'm making a point, and only making a point, if it was one of the 50 states, that'd be ranked number 50, 49th. Think about that. I mean, that's phenomenal. And my point being is this, is across all of the state of Texas, each economic region plays a significant role. Now, here earlier this week, I had announced what sales tax revenues were coming into the state treasury and why sales tax revenues, as your legislators can tell you, the cup, the glass that's in front of you, the top of that one third of that glass is your federal dollars, the bottom two-thirds is your state revenue dollars, and of the state tax portion, sales tax is 62% of that entire tax piece. So sales tax is a major driver of your state budget, and if you look at that portion, what I just announced a couple of days ago was our February sales tax collections compared to last year in February were down 6.7%. And you go, oh my goodness. But one thing that I have to point out, that that month a year ago was 11.7% higher than it was the February of 2014. So if you look across the state, one of the points I want to make, the last three months, yes, our sales tax numbers are down 4% compared to the same three months a year ago, but you have to understand, the last five months we're comparing ourselves to, 
were record highs in Texas. And so we were coming off of the highs of the oil boom. And if you look at the state treasury, yes, oil impacts treasury, and it has impacted our dollars, but the budget, it continues to work. And it will continue to work. And what we will forecast and we see in the revenue estimate numbers we revised last October because oil price, I had to downward adjust them to what the best data we had a, a year ago in January, is that if you look at the state economy, it's going to continue to grow. Are we going to grow at 5.8% growth that we had in 2014? No. Are we projected to potentially continue to grow at 2.4%, which is what we grew in 2015? Those are some of the estimates that we have. So we're going to continue to grow probably at some of those same numbers. Think about one other statistic, and this is just amazing. For 108 months in a row, Texas has had a lower unemployment level than that of the national average. Think about that. I might be an Aggie, but I can count. That's nine years. Nine years is phenomenal. And even last year, with a downturn in the oil industry and the manufacturing industry, and those two areas have lost more jobs than anywhere else, and those are the two top three industries, as in gross state product in the state, Texas still gained over 120,000 jobs. So the point being is this. Does Texas currently face some headwinds? Yes, because we're not immune to the national and global economic times. You look at the stock market the first few days of this year, it was some of the worst few days of the first of a year than we've ever had. The Chinese market, it triggered out in the first five minutes for three out of the first five days. So the point is, is we're interconnected with that economic activity. However, with that, Texas has been ranked the best place to do business for 14 years in a row. We've had lower unemployment than the national average for 108 months in a row or nine years. You take the fact that we have a lower cost of living on average than the other 49 states. The fundamentals of the reason why people move here, you mentioned earlier that my family moved here in the mid-1840s and 1846. And why did we move here? We moved here for an economic opportunity. You have on average 650 people still move to this state every single day. And why? for an economic opportunity. One of the things that I think is really uh, amazing here in East Texas is that East Texas has a higher graduation rate at the high school level than that of the other 11 economic regions in the state of Texas, and a higher graduation rate than that of the national average. And then also, if you look at whether it's Stephen F. Austin or other educational institutions here in East Texas, are really leading the way to provide more economic opportunities and job training to people, which is extremely important, not just for this region, but other portions of the state. And one other thing that I wanted to mention is that I appreciate Nacogdoches, the city in particular, if you look at the sales tax collections, remember I said that the state on average is down 4% compared to the same months a year ago? You know what has been here? positive 11%. So I need a lot more Nacogdoches to help prop up the other areas. And amazingly, last month, it was 14% higher than the same month a year ago. So economically, this region is helping some of the other areas of the state with that downward pressure. I want to mention one other thing that has nothing to do with economic in the state of Texas, but it's a very interesting program that we have in our office. If you ever work at a place of business and you move to another job and you may have a little bit of a day of a paycheck or two days or a few weeks and you left and you didn't get that, and I know you think who would ever do that, but somebody does, or if you put a utility deposit down somewhere and you forgot to get your utility deposit, or maybe you have a royalty check or you're the heir to a will, or even imagine this. Maybe somebody put something in a safe deposit box and they forgot about it. And you go, nobody does that. Well, try this one. I've got in my office, not literally in my office, so don't come break in and think you're going to find it there. We got it in a secure room. Just a little old gold bar that's about this big by this big, a little bit bigger than, than your phone. And that gold bar, somebody put it in a safe deposit box, and I guess they just forgot about it. So after the bank tried to find them for a few years, they couldn't find them. Where do they send? It's called unclaimed property, property that someone owns, yet they can't find you. They turn it over to who? To the state treasury. Who's the state treasurer? <laughs> Me. Well, that gold bar is worth $250,000. Or people have collected gold coins. 
all. We were talking about something about gold coins earlier today, weren't we? Uh, gold coins, if you add up all the gold coins, and I did this one day on my desk as a legislature, thank you to my state senator and some of the others, uh, y'all had put me in charge of the Texas Gold Bullion Depository, which I'm working to create. And I had an idea driving to office one day. I said, you know what, I want to do a play on the Gold Bullion Depository. I want to do a play about unclaimed property. So I had my unclaimed property division bring over all the gold we had. We put all the gold up on the desk. All the gold totaled about, and it was a bunch of different safe deposit boxes. It wasn't in one. $1.3 million worth of actual gold sitting on my desk. So I did a video, a little cute little video about, hey, we're creating a gold bullion depository in Texas, but until then, go to claimittexas.org to see if some of this gold is your unclaimed property. Now, how does that relate to Nacogdoches? The city alone, the people in town, there's $3 million worth of unclaimed property that my office is holding waiting for someone to go to claimittexas.org to see if it's your money. The county has $4 million. Now, in the state treasury, do you want to know how much money we returned to the citizens of the state of Texas last year from the unclaimed program? Claimittexas.org, if you forgot it. Try $250 million. Do you know how much money is in the state treasury waiting for someone in the state of Texas to come find it or me to find you? Try $4 billion. Dollars. We hold it, we manage it, and it is always yours or your heirs. And so I highly encourage you to go to claimittexas.org. And it's always fun be between now and me getting out the exit, especially in a room this size, I usually have somebody that goes, I've got $100. And I always wish that you would have told me before because I would have been happy to bring it to you and you could have bought me lunch, but y'all provided me lunch anyway, so never mind today. But I encourage you to go to claimittexas.org. It's a great program. It's money. We want to return it to you. And with that being said, thank you all for letting me be here. Is it, am I on time, Travis? You told me that I had to wrap it up. Is there any questions, comments, complaints? Usually I'll save the complaints for the legislators, and we got a whole pile of them here. So uh, any questions, comments, complaints? Going once, I feel like an auctioneer. Going twice. Well, thank y'all for letting me be here today. It's good to be with you. Thank you, Comptroller Hager, again. Let's give him a warm round of applause for being here, taking the effort, for coming up. And we really enjoy the talk. I'm sure he'll be around a little bit if you have some questions. Uh, he's really good. I think he's got the, the prediction for the oil prices you might want to hear. Sorry, Glenn, I had to do that. So, uh, but before we move on, we had that applause. In a little while, I'm going to ask you to give yourselves a round of applause. But before I do that, uh, you know, I've had several questions today about this event. This is a fantastic event. I'm very proud of what we've done here. Uh, I would like to take credit for it myself. I'd like to take credit for that 11% sales tax increase in Nacogdoches County, but my humility keeps me from doing that. And so, uh, so, but, but what, you know, people have said is, how did this thing get started? How did this Lone Star Summit uh, come about? And, you know, just like we're at the campus of SFA, Stephen F. Austin State University, it's named after the father of Texas, Stephen F. Austin. Well, there had to be a father of the Lone Star Legislative Summit. And so what I'm going to do at this time, I'm going to ask the, the, gov the, the senator to please join me over here. But uh, this happened about 10 years ago. There was a meeting, and we said, let's don't go to Austin every year. Let's have Austin come to us, DC come to us, and let's do a present, let, let's do a, a something there. And there was one person, one individual in this room who was singularly responsible for this idea. And I think it's appropriate to thank him publicly for the first time for the hard work he's done. I was gonna call him up here, but he's got a bad hip. He has worn his hip out in the service of this, site, this city and this university. So the senator and I are gonna walk over here and present two resolutions, one from the Texas Senate, and one from the Texas House, and a little memento of our appreciation to John Ruckel and Deborah Ruckel. All right, so again, give yourselves a big round of applause for being here today, making this special. John, Deborah, thank you so much for all you've done.
Now, we're, about to, we're, back, we're back on schedule. Actually, we're right on schedule. We have one other special treat for you. Uh, we have the producer, George Hooker, is in the room. George, where are you? There you have. Stand up there, George, so we can see you. There's a, a video. We, we're about to go to the movie theater and uh, begin our next panel on Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise, the Future of Healthcare in Texas at the SFA Movie Theater. But before we go down to that room, we're actually going to watch the movie here. It's a little bit of shameless promotion uh, for the, the city of Nacogdoches. George produced this. I will tell you, I watched this the first time. I live here, and it made me want to move here. So without further ado, if we could please roll the movie, and then we'll break. We'll have about 15 minutes after the movie to move back down to the main room and start the panel. But again, thank you for being here, and roll them. <laughs>
George, that was a great production. i got to say, the acting was even better. Uh, so with this, we're going to conclude lunch. Let's make our way out the door back to the big SFA room. We're going to stay on the schedule. Again, thank you for being here.